Hi, everyone. It's a uh, good afternoon for me, but I'm sure it's good morning and good evening for many of you joining us today in our IAU workshop on astrotourism. This workshop is organized by the International Astronomical Union Regional Office of Astronomy for Development, where we're going to be discussing different aspects of astrotourism. This is part of uh, the current flagship project that the Office of Astronomy for Development, based in Cape Town, South Africa, is developing. And we just thought it would be a very good uh, point to bring together different experiences, different case studies, and also different best practices of astrotourism from all around the world. We're going to have a series of talks, and uh, we're going to have these talks without questions, and all we'll ask these questions only at the end. If you have some questions and you're following us on YouTube, please write down your questions. You can just pose your questions as we go. And at the end, during the Q&A, we're going to bring your questions and we're going to be uh, asking them and discussing them with the different participants here. Before we start, my name is Pedro Russo. I'm going to be the host and I'm based at Leiden University, the Netherlands, where I co-coordinate the Regional Office of Astronomy for Development. And without further ado, I think I'm going to ask our first speaker, uh, Professor Steve Pompea, to share his screen. Steve is uh, at the moment a guest professor at Leiden University, but he's also the Emeritus Professor at Noir Lab in the United States of America. Steve, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And Steve is going to give us a personal, but hopefully very interesting overview of astrotourism. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I hope my screen is now visible to you. Just perfect, Steve. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank Pedro and Evina and Michelle and the other organizers for this great opportunity to share some ideas with you. <clears throat> I especially thank all of you who are participating from all across the world and, and your families as well. In some places, it'll be very late at night and others well before sunrise, before the start of a very full day, I'm sure. I know many of you work long hours operating astronomical facilities and programs, and some of you have small businesses, so thank you for attending. My overview has a very simple summary. Dark sky astrotourism, as, a, as our international field, has great potential and some significant risks and opportunities. I'm very optimistic because I think we're very good at problem solving. Let me give you an example. Uh, two astronomers uh, a long time ago, one Scottish and another from the Netherlands, uh, led a search from South Africa for stars closer than Alpha Centauri, the big star in the lower right on the left-hand uh, uh, picture. With the right understanding and approaches, they identified a nearby star we now call Proxima, Proxima Centauri, which we think is the closest star to our solar system. If you are wondering where it is, it's a little tiny I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this little star here, that's not it, but that actually represents this little star right here. And this is Proxima Centauri. So with the right understanding, the right approaches, the right problem solving techniques of um, a proper motion, a parallax, they were able to identify this star. I think we can do the same thing in our chosen field today. Um, I feel very fortunate to have the right preparations for astrotourism from my work as a classroom teacher, planetarium and museum worker, research astronomer, space instrument developer, passionate amateur astronomer, and a person who ran a full-time consultancy in science education, that is small business. Uh, however, like I think many of you who are also well prepared, my involvement here today and over the course of my career is actually inspired by the beauty of celestial phenomena and my love of the night sky, and especially the dark night sky. Um, my first astronomy experience that really got me going in astronomy was when I was seven years old on uh, vacation camping in Vesa Verde National Park in Colorado, which is the uh, state of the US where I was originally from. And I saw a beautiful dark night sky as an evening program from the Rangers, and I was hooked from that moment on. And uh, that, that interest continued to getting my master's degree in, in physics teaching at Colorado State University, where I was inspired by Roger Culver, 
who led a tremendously uh, vigorous program to get people interested in astronomy of all sorts. And many others have been inspired by Roger and um, uh, people like John Barentine from the Dark Sky Association as well. Um, I also led some dark sky programs inspired by George Wallace at Colorado State University at migrant farm camps in rural areas of Colorado. And uh, these people who, with their tremendous willingness to learn about, about astronomy, their interest in getting their families involved, uh, really inspired me in this way. And that led to also an admiration for some friends of mine who are professional whitewater river guides, Bill and Jamie Alexander. And they were part of a professional guide association, which showed me the value of, of getting together, sharing resources, um, working to elevate the field. And, and if you ever know anything about whitewater rafting, it's very, uh, it can be dangerous if you don't do the right things. So I've had the opportunity now to spend about 100 days in the Grand Canyon under very dark skies with my friends all on private trips. And that, that has been a great opportunity to connect with the night sky. Then other experiences like the Lodestar Project in New Mexico, the tremendous programs in Chile with the touristic observatory programs inspired by my colleague, uh, now deceased Ugo Ochoa, and the formation of a dark sky sanctuary there. Then continuing with our International Year of Astronomy, White House star parties, and so on. And now the new project we have at Kitt Peak National Observatory to refurbish the visitor center. All of these have really cemented my interest in astronomy in the dark night sky and in astrotourism. So I just put a few pictures up to remind you of the beauty of some of these places I visited, the visions of some of the people I've worked with, and even in the lower right, you can see a individual who used to work at Kitt Peak, who's now started his own astronomy tourism business. It's pretty much a one-man show from Chuck's Astronomy Adventures, Chuck Dugan. But he's now figured out a way to bring all of his equipment to different places to bring the astronomy to the people rather than to try to make them come to him for these great experiences. So that's been very inspiring to see these different efforts all across the world and to see what can be done with a large group of people or a very small kind of one person operation. So where is the niche that we're trying to find in our field of astrotourism? Well, first, I want to just say that it's it's a very dynamic niche, whatever it is. And there are a lot of evolving norms in this field and the related subspecialties. We we need to think about which, which of our programs, which of our facilities are part of cultural tourism or activity-based tourism, a broader category, or route tourism, such as in Chile, where you have the route of the stars and other places as well, uh, rural tourism initiatives, nature tourism. But I think where we're going to end up, because we're very idealistic, is in the category of principled ecotourism. At least it's some of us, some of the programs we have are going to go that way to principled ecotourism. And I just wanted to remind you that this isn't like a new thing. This has been around for a long time. And my friend and colleague, George Wallace at Colorado State, who was a professor of what was originally called Recreation Resources and now is in the College of Natural Sciences, has been working in this area since he left the Peace Corps many years ago, started migrant education programs and did many, many other things to protect uh, places, to protect special places on the earth. So he has a 1991 paper on this topic. He has a 1995 address and some more papers on this topic. And the basic point he makes, which I think is something we have to keep in mind, is that the principled ecotourism is not always about just a checklist of things. Like, for example, in the lower right is the EcoCamp Patagonia voted one of the best hotels in South America. I've never been there, but it looks fantastic. It's in a beautiful place. It uses um, these, these domes, it has solar panels, probably has composting toilets. The menu is probably using food that's uh, from the area and so on and so on. So they're doing a lot of things right for sure. I don't know all of the details, but George would say if he was here today that he would say, well, it's about the ethics. It's about the communication. It's about working with the community. It's about the indigenous people. It's not always about the checklist of solar panels or a low carbon footprint or this or that. That's all important, but there's more to it than that. So I just wanted to remind 
that that uh, we can uh, build on the principled ecotourism efforts of others over the last 30 years. We have many exemplary astrotourism programs worldwide, and we're going to hear about a number of them today. And they are great models for us to think about. They fall into many different categories. Some are about sustainable socioeconomic benefits for communities or small astronomy businesses. Some have to do with how education can play a role in these ventures. Uh, some work more closely with indigenous groups. Um, others are, are working with highly specialized audiences or diverse audiences. Obviously, there's uh, stewardship of dark sky areas in many of these programs. And then some are very special experiences. It could be a long-term astrophotography experience, or it could just be an additive experience. You're, you're tasting wine, and you get a little bit of astronomy at the end of your wine tasting. So there's many different varieties of the astrotourism experience, and there's many different ways to create those high quality experiences. Our challenge is to capture and duplicate the best practices of creating quality experiences, which, by the way, don't necessarily depend on super fancy equipment or even super fancy places that are incredibly beautiful. <clears throat> Depends a lot on people and how they've been trained. Our challenge is what I call, well, what many people would call total quality management, um, which, which is a whole movement that applies not only to manufacturing, but to education, to healthcare, and, and other, other things where you want to maintain a high quality level. We have to focus on the human dimensions of quality management. The good news is that we have a lot of assistance from international societies, from the tourism field, and many other resources that are available. And just to give you an example, when I went online to look around for books on, on ecotourism or nature-based tourism, I immediately came across from one, this is from one publisher, this took me all of five minutes, to find these books that are currently available, many of them in electronic form, on, on some of these basic principles that we might want to be thinking about. So this points out kind of two things. One is that we're not the experts in these things and that there's a lot of, lot of things to learn, but it also points out that we don't have to reinvent the wheel because there's an awful lot of research, PhD dissertations, uh, visitor studies, planning studies, strategic plans, and other things out there that can uh, benefit us greatly. For example, the maturity of the tourism field from an academic perspective is a great asset. And I, and I don't mean academic just in the sense of people publishing papers. Colorado State University, what I mentioned, I did my master's at and was an adjunct faculty member for 10 years, um, has the Warner College of Natural Resources. This includes the College of Forestry and, and so on. And they have a whole program on human dimensions of natural resources. They have another whole program on protected places. And if you look at their curriculum for human dimensions of natural resources and natural resources tourism, these are the courses that are required for the very first degree in that area. They have a master's program, they have a PhD program as well, they have postdoctoral researchers as well. But uh, just for that one program on natural resources tourism, they have courses in a wide variety of different areas, including marketing, history, natural resources, ethics, business, global awareness, and so on and so on. If you look down the list of general courses, the basic courses that they take after the most general ones, the specific courses for that major, and their internships, the variety of internships, and then their advanced courses, you see what the field really has to offer to, to us and what those people who are trained with these bachelors, masters, or PhDs in the field can also offer us in the long run. So I wanna pursue now a little more specific aspect of what, what we can do to improve our field. So I wanna do a little thought experiment for you. And that thought experiment is, suppose we've been charged with developing a strategy for the International Society for Astrotourism. Now, I don't think this society exists, maybe some form of it exists now, but as far as I know, it doesn't. 
But let's say we're starting this and we, the people on this call are the founding members. We're, we're quite diverse. So I've taken the liberty to provide a uh, mission statement, which might take quite a long time to come up with. But suppose our mission is to encourage the worldwide expansion of these high quality astrotourism experiences. So what do we do? We would start off, of course, by having strategic planning meetings for this new field. And we try to get all the different organizations and people and uh, other people who can help us along, maybe even a professional planner who can help us do some strategic planning in a sensible way. Um, and um, we could start with a very classic approach. There's what we call pestle analysis, which looks at sort of the longer term trends that are external typically to an organization. That's not so useful at the moment. Let's do what we call SWOT analysis, which is an honest assessment of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and threats. In other words, we want the big picture. We want to understand what we can do to grow, to make better products, to go to new markets, expand, and so on. So let's do a quick SWOT analysis. Now, I, I, again, these are things that should be done collectively, but I'm going to kind of speak for us. OK, now I have a slight problem as my computer doesn't want to let me move on. OK, there we go. Um, so let's talk about strengths. What are the strengths of our people and the organizations? So again, we're highly diverse. We're talking about some big and some small organizations, individuals. So obviously, these don't apply to everybody in every way. But bear with me for a moment. We have a great diversity. I just mentioned that. We have a great variety of professional backgrounds. We have a variety of scales. One thing we do share in common is a great passion and enthusiasm, our ability to problem solve. We're very committed to nature stewardship, many of us to changing the world. It's a very new field, so creative approaches are needed and appreciated in general, and we appreciate them. We have a commitment. We have a, a strong desire to share astronomy. We have an idealism. Very few of us are in this for the money. Uh, we also have life experiences of many people, many of whom are older or have second career people uh, who, who brought in a lot of, of uh, experience. And we certainly have an abundance of audacity and chutzpah. We like to just get out there and do something. Okay, that's great. Those are all the things we have to work with and many more that I didn't want to, uh, didn't have room to put down. So those are fantastic strengths and that makes me feel very, very good. Now, if you've ever done a SWOT analysis, you actually realize that your strengths and your weaknesses are all related because they, they're they part and parcel of the same thing. Some of the things that are your strengths actually can, can lead to some problems. So a weakness, it's a less mature field. We can't always agree on what is the best practice or where the field's going. We have a diversity of opinions and values. Some people want to make money, some refuse to make any money. We all, have, we all have probably a pretty limited background in tourism, but some of the people in our field are, are experts. Uh, business is something that a lot of people in our field aren't really that interested in. Business details, oh, that can't be too hard. I'll leave that to somebody else. Marketing, oh, that's just communication, isn't it? No, it's a specialized area. Um, some, some parts of our field are driven by the money. They're small businesses. They have to make money or they're out of business. And Often, I have to be honest about it, we suffer from the Dunning-Kruger effect of things we know very little about, we think we're pretty good at just because we're smart people. So hubris and arrogance. Uh, we underappreciate the role of money to actually make things done. We're so used to making it happen without money, we, we sometimes underappreciate the importance of money. Um, and that creates some extra risk. We also rely on individuals who are passionate. And since many of our organizations are pretty young, we sometimes suffer from the founder syndrome where strong personality or strong vision is there to push an organization along, but maybe there's a new vision needed. Maybe there's a new direction needed, but the founder is still there saying, let's, let's go the old way. And finally, um, we're rather modest, I have to say, and timid towards fundraising and big projects. Okay. That's my assessment. You don't have to agree with me, but this is a great discussion at some point. What are the opportunities that we have? We have elements in our environment that can help our field. Um, there's lots of good things that um, create opportunities, mainly being a young field and so on. But 
uh, opportunities to create facilities in new regions. Uh, it's really wide open for opportunities um, with uh, more people traveling, with more disposable income, more interest in national parks. Um, we have great programs from the International Dark Sky Association and other places for certification of dark sky parks, reserves, starlight reserves, and so on. So that's fantastic. Great opportunities. Okay, let's move to the threats, because that's what we're going to have to address at some point. There's elements in our environment that can cause problems or trouble or can set us back. And these kind of fall into two categories. One are general threats that we may not be able to do too much about because they're cultural. We really can't change ourselves that much. Um, and they're just there. So we have to be aware of them and aware of the effects of those threats on us. Um, tourism is, is on its back legs. Uh, many touristic uh, observatories and places are almost dead, uh, especially in Chile. Um, so that's um, a problem. Um, the, uh, there's competition, there, there's capital investment required. We don't seem to have a lot of that. We often concentrate too much on ad hoc and heroic efforts and so on. So we have these long-term issues which have a problem, but we have more specific issues which I think we can do something about. That's, that's what's exciting. Let me, let me go into a little more detail on these. One is we have a bit of isolation, desire for sites, research sites to, to, to do research, to be isolated, to have the darkest skies, to not be interfered with by, by visitors. We have the isolation of our practitioners. Again, we have many small operators who lack resources and um, a lack of place to provide on-site training and, and a lack of money for large ambitious uh, programs, which could, could work on some of these things. But the good news is that we have agency to change these issues that relate to lack of support. So what am I suggesting? Let me go through this now because we're getting to the end of the talk. Um, we could expand our resources and create some synergies. For example, this professional society that I mentioned in the thought experiment. We could involve lots and lots of people from lots and lots of sides of our, of our niche, and that can help, help all of us move together and move forwards in a concerted way. We can encourage the expansion of visitations, for example. So visitations are typically people-oriented. You have so many guides, you only allow visitors one day a week. And that creates a fact that you have a lot more demand to visit historical places, uh, uh, research observatories like Cerro Tololo or Kitt Peak. And we just can't uh, serve those without scaling it up. So we could take a strong statement to scale these things up. Of course, it's going to cost some money. It's going to cost some more training efforts. But it isn't like we have to invent a new model or change things around tremendously. It's a pretty easy thing to do. We can focus on creating and improving professional resources. And we're going to hear more about that today as well. We can also work on creating on-site training programs at, at some high capacity facilities. In other words, places that have an education mission that aren't trying to just make the ends meet and make the books balance at the end of the month, but have a strong mission for training and education. We can use those sites potentially as an opportunity to move people uh, through them, to train them and do that. So I'm just throw, throwing out a few possibilities for phase one, phase two in different parts of the world and places like Kitt Peak and Lowell Observatory in Arizona or in Chile at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, which is the branch of the US National Observatory. Um, those are places that um, potentially could be these, these sites. And um, finally, I'd like to say, you know, we've got to, I think, move on and dream and go big. We have to think about large fundable projects or programs that advance the astrotourism goals of getting a critical mass and critical amount of services in order to serve our entire community. So projects of five million euros or more or mid-scale projects of a quarter of a million euros would be very useful, not just to do the project, but to advance the whole critical mass of the field to mobilize people to create what we need to do for training sites for other for other reasons. Now the good news, even though these are ambitious projects, the good news is there's a lot of expertise and experience with large projects available. 
Uh, the Lodestar project in New Mexico, which I mentioned briefly earlier, was a project to design a whole mesa top full of astronomy activities for the public. It had a tramway going from the bottom of the, of the, of the land in New Mexico up to the top of this mesa. It's on top of a large mesa that was uninhabited. So it had a planetarium off to the side. It had observatories. It had museums, exhibits. It had all kinds of night sky activities in an incredibly dark sky. Similarly, more recently, and Lodestar was never built, and that's an interesting story by itself. That part of Lodestar was never built. The Enchanted Skies Park part of it was never built. Other parts were built. The Open Deck Observatory at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff is a great example. Just opened up. Um, there's a wonderful YouTube video that explains what it looks like, how it's being used, what the facilities are. Encourage you, you'll get the uh, I'm sure you'll get this presentation so you can see the link. I uh, encourage you to take a look at that uh, video of this tremendous. And, and the people who um, helped uh, make this thing happen are, are on the call today. So there's people with great expertise in community organizing, community fundraising, uh, design of science centers, design of planetariums, design of outdoor facilities, and uh, who have navigated these kinds of situations not, not dozens of times, hundreds of times in their career. That's pretty impressive. So in conclusion, there is tremendous promise in this field. We have a lot of things to think about. There's a lot of approaches, quality issues to, to deal with. Um, we need to um, make some steps in a forward direction to support infrastructure and to develop a critical mass. My fear my, is that the risk is that this field will stagnate uh, or evolve in unwanted ways. In other words, others will take control. Maybe they're not as interested in the quality. Maybe they're not as interested in ecotourism or community development or rural this, uh, rural, rural facilities. Um, so we need to take charge, find out what we want and, and sail towards it. Uh, we do have the agency, the power, the ability, the motivation to encourage the growth and professionalization. But we have to do this with a strong recognition that there is a quite a diverse field of, of large uh, providers, if I can call them that, such as uh, research observatories, which have a strong education mission, have a lot of infrastructure, have beautiful sites and dark sky areas, and small providers who are spread uh, also throughout the world. The larger providers are spread in South Africa, in Chile, uh, the United States, and a few other places, Australia. New Zealand. But there is an amazing amount of expertise. Okay, thinking big and obtaining significant money early, not, not, a, not, not designing the project and, and hoping we can find some money to do it. Thinking big and thinking about money early, I think is perhaps the least risky way to progress and the most efficient way to move these things forward. So I wanted to emphasize this last point. This is my own personal view. Um, and I know some may disagree, but I'm speaking as a person who's led many ambitious uh, all volunteer projects, such, such as the uh, Galileo Scope project and some of the International Year of Astronomy projects and unfunded projects, as well as some underfunded uh, projects, some barely funded projects, some that were adequately funded and some that were very, very well funded. So I've, I've played this game from all sides. I've um, been involved with about $20 million of, um, of money that we went after competitively in educational projects and won. And we've created some great projects. We've also done an equal number of projects with very little money. And I think that um, we have the opportunity to accomplish a lot more by going after the money. Now, I'm not at all unidealistic. I believe very strongly in what Margaret Mead said many years ago that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world, indeed is the only thing that ever has. But I'd like to put a small friendly amendment on that. A small group of thoughtful, committed citizens with some resources can do even more. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Steve, also for your talk and also for providing an interesting overview of the different aspects of astrotourism, but also in terms of um, 
in, in terms of your vision, what you expect from the field. We really appreciate that. And I know it's resonating with some of the viewers. So if you are following us on YouTube, please make sure that you post your questions. You post your questions on the YouTube because we're going to bring them back. And I think without further ado, we can just uh, move on to our next speaker. That is Professor Kumikato. And Kumikato-san is going to talk about global sustainable tourism. Hopefully... Kumikat, I think you have to turn on your camera and your microphone. Kumikato, is it working for you? Sorry, I seemed just to lost the connection. Can uh -huh, you no problem, but you are back. I, we can I'm, see you I'm well. Yes, and you can see your slides. Sorry. So feel free very to sorry. initiate, uh, to start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very sorry about- Thank you so much. No problem, it was perfect. Um, hello everyone, my name is Kumikato from Wakayama University. I'm from Musashino University Happiness Institute. My friend, just me, if you're a professor at the Tourism and the Happiness Institute, no one would take me serious. <laughs> but um, um, today I'm very, very honored to be part of this workshop because um, really I'm not a specialist in uh, dark sky or astronomy, but I specialize in sustainable tourism. So today, um, I'll be very happy if I can just uh, in this short presentation, I can offer some community perspectives in sustainable tourism because in Japanese uh, tourism is seeing the light this character is light and I that's something I really believe in um, so we the tourism can discover or identify and also enhance the light if we did it properly and um, so tourism can be a really great platform uh, that can involve diverse stakeholders in a defined uh, destination. According to UNWTO, tourism can be a major benefit because it can account for one in 10 jobs, employment, as well as 10% of the, the global GDP. So this is obviously pre-COVID. At the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, the major impact could be negative. So tourism uh, uh, before COVID, uh, when tourism obviously having a very downturn at the moment, but um, pre-COVID, the two uh, serious problem that we uh, scholars in tourism talked about was that the climate change, as well as over tourism. Um, climate change, because tourism cannot do without transport, obviously, and then which uh, its emission could account up to five or sometimes eight percent of the global emission, um, of which 75 percent is transport related. And some of the over tourism uh, effect, uh, I think many people in the Uh, tourism areas has experienced that just um, an um, unacceptable congestion or closure or the cancellation of the events and even some tourism movement. Um, obviously, in our uh, mission. And obviously, that is a very serious mission for tourism. So we need to uh, reduce the tourism footprint in emission or energy use, or as well as um, food waste, obviously. But at the same time, uh, tourism trying to do that uh, 
uh, what it's supposed to be doing, finding the light. So challenging various exploitation, inequality, discrimination, and bias. So our really mission in the sustainable tourism is to bring ecological and social justice. That along with this uh, uh, um, global shift towards uh, five Ps from the triple bottom line. So the P obviously represent prosperity rather than formally uh, economic profit and partnership and peace. I have seen, I have a privilege of working with many great communities uh, such as this one was that the sea community uh, divers in Japan. Uh, sorry, I'm going to skip that. Uh, <laughs> and the community-based tourism initiatives in, this is uh, Flores Island in Indonesia. Um, this probably is one of the famous uh, recent uh, uh, example in a community-based initiative in the indigenous tourism, the closure of Uluru in Central Australia where the community's uh, sacred place, the Wululu, or in more popular term, Ed's Rock, that was closed for uh, climbing uh, in, as of 2019, October. Um, another very great uh, example, um, in the recent uh, community initiatives or well, this is national initiatives, but um, this is the, the pledge and vision put forward by the community. Um, so this is a uh, tourist uh, actually asked to sign the pledge uh, when they actually arrive in the country. So similar uh, 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 approach has taken in New Zealand, like Tiaki promise, and Tiaki is the Maori word in in uh, New Zealand, Maori term, care for the land, or the uh, Iceland has taken a similar uh, approach as well. Just uh, in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about uh, in, uh, uh, in Australia. Uh, so this is the my only uh, dark sky related uh, tourism experience. So that was related to the return of Hayabusa um, uh, in 2010, which is that after seven years of journey and Hayabusa returned to the earth, um, uh, that was central Australia. So what we did, uh, we obviously, you know, we were, um, uh, we were research crew, but as well as that was our tourism experience. But what we did, it was very, uh, we thought it was very important to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. So in Australia, it is the customary, becoming a customary. So when you have any kind of events or gathering, we always acknowledge and pay respect to that the indigenous community, uh, the traditional owners of the land. So in this case, that the region was called Umera, and then uh, uh, the traditional owners was Kokotha and Antakalinya people. So we went to pay respect this elder, uh, Eileen Wingfield. And also we actually had a, a community engagement and schools. And then we talked about the traditional stories and, uh, of that uh, place. So this is just, um, uh, oops. I just don't want to play this video. So this is, oh, sorry, this doesn't work, doesn't, sorry, I have to, maybe I have to come out once. Oh, sorry, it seems just froze and I'm not going to play. So this was that the return, uh, the moment of the return. And also what was very important for us that uh, this was uh, made at the end of, uh, after our trip, so this was a pay respect and a gratitude to that uh, uh, traditional owners of the, the Umina region um, that was made uh, by the, the Japanese uh, JAXA. So um, this was very, uh, very, my very short perspectives that uh, um, 
giving value to the community perspectives in sustainable tourism. So thank you. That was my 10 minutes. Sorry that the, my, um, it was- No problem. We got your yeah, message it, it, loud and clear. Sorry, and thank it was you so much. unstable, no, sorry. No, no, Commissar, uh, no worries. I think it, will, uh, it worked well. Well, and thank you so much for your insights and also your pers perspective. I think it was very interesting and I think a lot of um, interesting aspects that we need to keep in consideration for astrotourism. So I'm going to ask Sonal to start her presentation and I will introduce uh, Sonal Acostra as our next speaker. And Sonal, please turn on your microphone and share your screen. And Sonal is going to talk about the Global Himalayan Expedition, a project that... Um, it's been also funded by the IU Office of Astronomy for Development uh, grants. So now the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are on the planet. My name is Sonal Eskotra, and I will be talking about AstroStace. It's a community-led astrotourism model that leverages astronomy to create sustainable livelihood for communities that are residing in rural and remote areas. Now, as the tourism industry navigates through the COVID-19 crisis and the world gradually reopens, interest in nature-based and open-air experiences are on the rise. The tourists of tomorrow are now looking to move away from overcrowded touristic hotspots to actually not just explore remote offbeat destinations, but also connect and connect with the communities that they visit. Now, the question is that how can the rural areas benefit from the opportunities that the restart of tourism will bring and how can we actually help them build back better? Uh, now, by the very nature of astrotourism, some of the most incredible vantage points for great dark skies are predominantly lo located in rural and remote areas. But, from, but speaking from an astrotourism perspective, the communities that are residing in these remote areas have not been integrated very well in the entire tourism value chain. And that's one of the reasons that uh, despite growing very strongly in the last couple of decades, astrotourism has not been able to, kind, to bring the kind of socioeconomic development that it could actually bring. So uh, in 2018, we uh, collaborated with the Office of Astronomy for Development to create a community-led astrotourism model called AstroStace, which was owned and operated completely by the communities. A bit of context about our organization, Global Himalayan Expedition. We work in the Indian part of Himalayas to provide clean energy access to remote communities. And we have till date, we've electrified almost 151 villages, impacted 67,000 67, lives and offset almost at 500 tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, and we've always followed a very holistic development approach in the sense that um, in most of the community-based interventions, you cannot just parachute into an area, you know, try to do an intervention with the community and move out. It has to follow a process where you engage with the community um, and you know, bring them up to speed, get their buy-in, and then build on the layers and the models that you bring to make it more sustainable. So we start with solar electrification, uh, move on to digital education, health access, and then finally in the areas that we work in Himalayas, because tourism is you know, one of the major drivers of economy, we're also looking at creating these astro home states. Um, so like I said, we work in the Indian part of Himalayas. It's, it's a long mountain range uh, and lack of electricity, education and access to sustainable monetary incomes are some of the critical problems that the people residing in remote Himalayan communities face. Uh, but as we all know, it has rich culture and heritage, something that has attracted tourists from all over the world. And tourism in the last couple of days has last couple of decades has actually risen exponentially uh, and has actually become the major GDP contributor for the Himalayan region. But one of the assets that we wanted to explore and build on were the clear night skies of Himalaya, something that was untapped, and we wanted to see how we could harness the potential for that. So, uh, and, and this is uh, our team. Uh, like I always say, none of us are astronomers all of us electrical engineers and and that's one of the reasons that you know we were able to see astrotourism through a different lens 
So uh, how did we start? I mean, I'll, I'll take you through a small case study of our implementation in Himalayas. No matter how clear or grand an idea is in your head for a community interpretation uh, intervention, you cannot just walk in with you know, a big fat telescope into a community and say that we are here to create a new channel of revenue generation for, uh, for you. It doesn't really work that way. So uh, before we actually started working with the communities uh, and you know, started our training workshops with the people who actually wanted to implement this model, our team leaders on the ground actually visited almost 15 villages, um, you know, talking to people, mobilizing them, and working with the communities very, very strongly to talk about the intervention and to also see what their expectations are if an intervention related to astrotourism is actually brought into the area. So you see a picture of one of our team leaders talking to the villagers in Man, where this, uh, where the astrosays have been set up, and. Um, and you also see the Pangong Lake on the banks of which the astro stays are. Um, and, you know, there, there have been mobilizations, focus group discussion, basically, you know, uh, making your model strong enough so that you have a community buy-in. And when you actually move out uh, of the area, it is sustainable enough that the community is able to maintain it. Um, and then after we visited 15 villages, 30 women were selected, uh, and we started training the community on telescopes and basics of astronomy. And the way we went about it was because uh, the people that we worked with uh, in, term, in, in the workshop came from a very diverse set of educational background, right from zero to elementary to even high school education. And we started engaging them with science by deconstructing astronomy and making it more relatable to them uh, by their own cultural connection with the skies. Uh, and you see some of the sessions where, you know, there are people who are even differently challenged, um, and most of them were women who were actually running the homestays. Um, and and uh, it is also important that you equip your team members with latest gadgets and tools. Uh, so you see a picture of one of our team members in Astro stays using Stellarium. Generally, what they do is, uh, you know, we have sky maps available. And, you know, at the start of the month, they generally kind of scan through the sky maps, look at Stellarium to see what particular objects would be there at different times in the sky so that they are also able to set their expectations of the travelers. And if there's an overcast, et cetera, there are alternate solutions that are also available. Um, and, and the picture of one of our astro stays. Um, and one of the best things about astro stays is that it's Astrotourism, I would say, is that it necessitates overnight stays. So um, the the astro stays have actually been set uh, have actually been set up on the banks of a very famous lake called Pangong, and people would actually travel from Leh, which is the capital of Ladakh, to generally make a day trip to Pangong and then come back. Now, because astro stays were set up, it necessitated that people actually stayed back. So there were two channels of revenue generation that started coming to the community. One was uh, because of the accommodation that people started staying back. And second was also because of the stargazing session. If people were even staying in some lodges or resorts nearby, and they knew that, you know, there are some stargazing sessions, they would also just walk in. Um, and this would also help the community to earn an extra money. Uh, there, these are pictures of some of the astronomy sessions uh, taking place in the villages. Uh, and and the, the, the five member team, the, the team in Man consists of five women who actually run it and you see one of them using the lasers uh, and they say that it cannot be sustainable if it is not accessible so how do you really close the loop i mean you can create these brilliant hot spots of you know um touristic models in an area but if people cannot visit there travelers cannot actually come there it really is of no use so the whole point of creating astro stays was to bring the money directly into the communities um and once you know they were set up we started doing the market linkage basically promoting astro stays on otas platforms like booking.com airbnb and other offline channels as well for example you have these visitor information centers in most major cities and we started, you know, publishing these small pamphlets and brochures about the astro stays so that people who were visiting the cities would come to know about them and visit the astro stays. 
Uh, now, the last year was very, very hard on the tourism industry. So what did we do? Uh, the money that was generated uh, through the Astro Stays was actually reinvested back into the community. They bought 10 solar heaters and 15 greenhouses were set up. Uh, something that, so, so the money that was actually earned through these sessions actually helped to help the community during the COVID period. So you see, uh, you know, solar heaters being set up and greenhouses, which actually made the community quite self-sufficient during these very, very hard times. Um, and this has been the impact so far. We have in, we had almost, we set up in 2019 and we had almost like four to five months, a very short period to test the pilot and test the waters. And in those four or five months of implementation, we created six Astro Stays, trained 30 women, and we had a revenue which was generated around $3,200. This was both through the accommodations as well as through all the stargazing sessions that was the community um, was conducting. Uh, and we link our Astro Stays very, very strongly to the SDGs because uh, you can only close the loop if you are actually monitoring and evaluating your model very well. So, so we have these parameters and the SDGs, which we follow very, very closely and keep monitoring as to see how we can improve things better. And now that the world is going digital, we are also trying to create an app, uh, both for the travelers as well as for our communities back in Man, uh, for the communities specifically to broadcast any special celestial events or any special in events of interests that they could actually talk about whenever these stargazing sessions are happening. Uh, and for the travelers, especially to kind of see where all these astro stays are set up, what is it that, give, that they can expect in terms of cultural and community uh, aspect and what are the objects that 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 is that they can expect to see when they are in a particular area uh, so the way forward looks very exciting as nature-based and regenerative tourism emerge very very strongly uh, from the very small success and our experiences that we have seen in the himalayas we we do feel that you know there is huge potential for astro stays not just for rural communities but also for communities in mountainous areas or for even that matter wildlife protection areas which have access to great skies because of almost negligible light pollution um and we do believe that you know i, I think it's about time that you know we create this common ground between the two domains of astro tourism of astronomy and tourism as well. So um, thank you very much. Really hope that you enjoyed this journey into Himalayas. Thank, thank you, you, Sonal. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the, uh, also the, the followers on YouTube enjoyed it a lot. There were some very nice comments. And also thank you so much for, for showing us some amazing ways of uh, really in, improving the communities, local communities, remote communities throughout the tourism. I think your project is very inspiring. And I think also thank you so much for also helping so much organizing this workshop. But we're going to have some time for questions later on. So I'm going to uh, invite uh, Professor Hidiko Agata to share his screen. Uh, Professor Agata is from the National Astronomic Observatory of Japan and is also the founder and uh, president of the board of the Sora Tourism Japan the Astro Tourism Society of Japan. Thank you, Agata san for joining us. Thank you, Pedro san. So today I hope, uh, hello everyone. Uh, at, I was been at Tokyo, Japan, just now uh, PM 9.30. So uh, I, today I hope to talk about the solar tourism. Solar tourism is Astro Tourism Japan. Okay, so uh, first question. Why do we look up at the stars? <coughs> I think uh, there are uh, two contexts for the promotion of astro tourism. Okay, first uh, context of society. Uh, as already uh, uh, Professor Kumi Kato-san uh, mentioned, uh, astro tourism is an important SDGs uh, uh, matter. IAU. Our IAU uh, strategic, uh, <coughs> strategic plan, uh, including this astro tourism, uh, contribute to the SDGs, uh, especially uh, economic growth, uh, developing countries and uh, local area of each country. Not only uh, <coughs> social uh, context, we have a, a personal context. Personal context uh, means, uh, for example, <clears throat> please see this uh, journal of uh, personality and social uh, psychology. 
2015 published uh, Dr. Pif Azar's paper. Uh, title is uh, Are the Small Self and Prosocial Behavior? Uh, this uh, psychology field uh, um, it, uh, paper uh, explain uh, when we feel ah, 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 I hope to explain, ah is a, a, a strong motivation rather than wonder. Uh, ah or oh, or oh, oh, wow. uh, we, we feel this uh, uh, emotion by the uh, uh, star watching, uh, astrotism, or other uh, uh, et, uh, examination. So we feel small self and uh, try to uh, pro social behavior to society. If this research result is true, uh, astrotism is a very important action for us, uh, not only SDGs uh, <coughs> et, uh, success, uh, but also personally. Uh, it's a very important uh, occasion. And uh, finally, uh, Boshuei, uh, our the earth is a, a better world to through all these uh, activities, I, I believe so. So how shall we encourage astrotism? I hope to explain uh, case study in Japan. Uh, 2017, uh, we uh, established uh, Solar Tourism Promotion Council. I, I am a, a director and uh, work with uh, uh, JAXA astronauts and uh, Japanese government uh, uh, tourism agency support our activities. By the way, what is the SORA? SORA means, uh, SORA is a Japanese <coughs> uh, language and word, and uh, SORA, uh, uh, and this show, <coughs> show, SORA, including the sky, space, universe. Then. Uh, solar tourism, including the astro tourism and the space tourism. Okay, so our council activities is uh, uh, first is uh, marketing research, second, uh, information dis dissemination, uh, to use a uh, web or uh, uh, books as well. So, and uh, tourism event, human resource development, uh, consulting, and uh, brand making. So, our member, our council members, uh, three categories exist. First category is a local government, Japan, or example, Nagano Prefecture, Totori Prefecture, the small towns, village, so 21 regions already participate, uh, especially local, uh, very population few field, uh, nature with very beautiful mountainside. And the uh, second category is uh, companies. Companies are not only travel agencies, uh, Anna is a big travel agency, but uh, uh, Big Sen is a telescope company, and Dent is a uh, uh, to advertisement agency, and Oscar is a, a model and actress agency. Very, uh, it, uh, a lot of field players uh, participate for solar tourism council. And uh, finally, individual members personally can participate for uh, Star Sommelier, we call that is uh, star navigators. Uh, and uh, uh, three year, uh, uh, these three are uh, supported by the government, Japan uh, Tourism Agency. Uh, totally three years, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a matching fund. Uh, government uh, uh, support us the 0.2 million US dollar totally. Okay. So then we encourage uh, uh, our uh, islands to all field or uh, region especially a, a countryside, beautiful stargazing place. Uh, I hope to explain uh, a marketing research result. We uh, hope to, uh, uh, to research the uh, solar tourism in Japan's market size. So use uh, this panel system, we at uh, random one million pass, uh, uh, 10,000 persons select and they uh, survey the questionnaires. And the uh, second survey, we uh, detail to understand their motivation and how to, their ho hopings. Uh, so 
number of uh, participate in solar tourism. Uh, this estimation, it is estimated that uh, 8.5 million people uh, already uh, participate in solar tourism activities. Okay. And, uh, but uh, this 8.5 million, including the uh, go to the planetary, planetary is uh, 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 80%, including for this 5.5 5 uh, million to 80%. And uh, Eclipse show is uh, 53%, uh, Science Medium beating the 42, and Meteor Shower uh, observing the 32. Uh, participate the trip uh, astrotism is uh, uh, 90%, 1.7 million already participate in Japanese people. So, uh, okay. And our uh, prospect, our protest, it is estimated about 40 million people are expected to participate in the solar tourism in the future. So, planetarium is a big, huge number expected, but uh, as this uh, uh, PowerPoint shows, in order of uh, participation in trip to look at the study, study skies, uh, thirty-six percent. It's a, a huge number. Uh, After tourism in Japan, conclusion is that uh, fifty million Japanese people are expected to the, uh, participate in astrotism. Uh, it's a uh, ten times. Uh, uh, about 10 times uh, <coughs> big number uh, or already expected persons. So all that change means uh, uh, our world change means. So I uh, we all already published guidebook. Oh, this guidebook is uh, uh, like a, uh, like a, uh, these books in Japanese, uh, astro tourism guidebook. So, uh, this guidebook is a published timing, Amazon ranking. Uh, of course, uh, um, astronomy books are first place, not only this field. Uh, this uh, uh, travel guide uh, magazine and uh, books field, the third uh, place uh, got. So very, very people, a lot of people uh, interest for this astrotism field. But uh, last year's survey, uh, our uh, marketing research, uh, awareness, awareness means uh, People who know the solar tourism, solar tourism name no person is only six percent of our uh, Japanese population, total population. It means uh, we need more uh, uh, strong uh, uh, um, encourage is necessary. I think so. So uh, uh, finally, I hope to show the uh, uh, PR movies uh, when time coming. So. Please stop Pedro San Fen time coming. Sorry for Japanese version, but uh, please uh, enjoy for our solar tour. Thank you, Gata San, also for the for the video, Thank you. for the Thank trailer, you so and for the presentation you. for the incredible ecosystem that exists in Japan for astro tourism. Is that really I think is really inspiring, maybe for other other countries how to get the astro tourism organized. And I'm sure they can learn a lot from from your model. So I think I'm going to already ask our next speaker. It's going to be Hannah Dalglish. Uh, she's going to talk about astro tourism research and practice. Hannah, you can start sharing your screen and uh, unmute yourself and thank you so much for joining us thank you 
Um, okay. So thank you everyone. And it's really a great pleasure to be here. So I have been um, involved in astrotourism research for just over a year now. And I've been based in at the University of Namibia and the University of Oxford. Um, so here's going to be a summary of kind of the things that I've learned from doing a bit of tour research myself and the tour, the other research that I've come across in astrotourism. So first of all, um, as has already kind of been discussed, what is astrotourism? So it can come under two main branches, which is one space tourism, which is literally um, tourists actually traveling to space, which we're not really seeing now, but potentially within the next few years, and the other being terrestrial astrotourism, so essentially astronomy-related tourism taking place on the Earth. And this can involve many, many different activities. For example, going to visit a space center, seeing a rocket launch, visiting an observatory during the day or at nighttime doing astrophotography, visiting an archaeoastronomical site like Stonehenge, traveling to see a total solar eclipse, um, or visiting a dark sky area and doing what I like to call dark sky tourism. So some of the reasons why I like the terminology of dark sky tourism possibly more than astrotourism is because astrotourism is so broad and so vast and in does involve so many different activities. Um, and I think dark sky tourism helpfully sort of narrows things down so that it, you're really specifically talking about activities that are taking place in dark sky places um, or oases during the night. And um, I think there are other advantages as well. I think um, sometimes the word astro or astronomy can be a little bit scary for people. Um, so dark sky tourism can possibly be a bit more accessible in terms of, say, communities that are interested in getting a job or learning more about running dark sky activities to tourists that might um, want to go to a dark sky place and do some stargazing. And it's really clear in the name dark sky tourism what you'll actually be doing um, if you're doing those kind of activities. Um, so as we've already seen many times uh, already during these talks, these are the sustainable development goals and just a few more examples of how dark sky tourism uh, relates to some of these goals. And also I would personally think that dark sky tourism possibly links to even more of the goals than astrotourism in general. So we've already heard some nice statistics um, for economic advantages. Um, here's another paper that was looking um, at dark sky areas in the Colorado Plateau and found that over the next 10 years, uh, tourists will be spending almost $6 billion um, in the area, which will create $2.5 billion in higher wages, many, many jobs, 10,000 jobs at least a year annually. Um, and what's also great is that it brings visitors to dark sky areas um, during off-peak time, so in the winter, where possibly you have less tourists than during the summer. And so this can be quite a sustainable way of helping rural and remote communities, getting more um, opportunities, more work, and trying to help reduce um, the effects of, of, say, younger generations that are moving to cities to find work. Um, so this may help to, to mitigate that, as well as bringing, say, new infrastructure to rural communities. Of course, there are also many social benefits. And one of the things I find interesting um, is the lack of research on, um, say, mental health and well-being from being in a dark sky oasis. And um, there is quite a lot of research on, say, your health and well-being for being in nature, being in a forest, but all of that focuses um, on the daytime and not during the night. So there has um, maybe been one or two papers that does look a bit into 
being in a, under the stars in a dark sky area and how that might impact your mental health, for example, um, in the field of environmental psychology. But there is so much more, I think, that can be done in this area. And um, it would be great to see more of that happening. Also, there are many, many benefits for bringing, say, dark sky tourism to rural areas. It brings more educational opportunities, not only for the tourists, but also the people that are living there. Um, to learn more about astronomy and science in general. Um, there are also ways that we find in which it can help to preserve indigenous knowledge. So where I've been working in Namibia in the past, um, I've found that there are some villages where the Sam people are living and they're actually losing uh, the stories about the stars that they would be told by their grandparents around the fire. Um, and so when I asked them, what are the stories that you remember, they couldn't, they couldn't remember any. So now is really a crucial time um, before it's even completely too late uh, to, to find out the stories and make sure that they're not lost forever. Then, of course, there are many environmental benefits of dark sky tourism. Here's just a, a map uh, that comes from NASA that looks at the light pollution all around the world um, because it's essentially an image taken at night time. And here's some work by Fabio Falchi, who has actually worked out that 83% of people around the world are living under light polluted skies. And this increases to 99% of Europeans if you're just looking at Europe specifically. And that is really, really enormous. So light pollution really is everywhere where people are living. And there is a lot of work being done um, in how to reduce this and get communities to engage and governments as well. Um, and that's also obviously a lot of energy that is being used to power these lights. Um, there has been some work done by the International Dark Sky Association, which found that it's worth about $3 billion of, of just extra wasted light that isn't really necessary at nighttime, um, which also equates to a lot of carbon that's being wasted and being put into the atmosphere as well. Of course, that's not to say that there are many impacts on uh, people, but also on um, wildlife. And it really, light pollution interferes with all sorts of animals, insects, um, plants. And there are even some studies that say that uh, cancer can perhaps be a result or not a, a direct result of light pollution, but there could be some effects going on there as well. Um, so looking more closely at Namibia, where I've been working, um, Namibia really is a very good country to do dark sky tourism. As this map here shows, uh, most of Namibia is very, very dark. Um, this is the capital city, Vintuk, right in the middle there. And um, there's many opportunities. So I'm using astro tourism here because there are things that can happen during the day, like visiting um, the HESS telescopes, which is one of the world's biggest high energy telescopes, uh, which is located near the Gamsberg mountain. There's also the Hober meteorite here, which is the largest meteorite in the world. Um, there's also a dark sky reserve, the first um, dark sky reserve in all of Africa, and also many astro farms where essentially as, uh, amateur astronomers have been traveling to Namibia for decades now um, to basically do a lot of astrophotography and do some amazing stargazing. So really lots of potential for opportunities. So I my work has kind of been looking at training local tour guides in astronomy knowledge so that they can maybe get more jobs at, at lodges and get more of an extra income because many lodges in Namibia aren't actually offering stargazing activities and many lodges are very, very brightly lit so that you can't really see the stars uh, where you are, but it would be really easy to if the lodges just had a bit more knowledge about the potential of stargazing, um, say, after dinner with the guests. 
and would just dim their lights a bit. So we've kind of been working with different organizations in Namibia to, to share kind of the opportunities and potential of dark sky tourism and astrotourism there. Finally, uh, just to mention that we've been developing a new academic network, which is essentially to bring researchers together that are interested in dark sky tourism and, and also dark skies and society. There's a lot of research on light pollution and the environment, how it impacts our physical health. And um, there's really little research on, say, the mental health aspects um, and also the socioeconomic benefits and, and, and sustainable other sustainable development goals as well. Um, so essentially, this network is to try and encourage and boost um, the research and evidence side of things. So if you are someone that's doing that or wants to do that um, and you're an academic, please let me know and I'll definitely be happy to add you to this network. So thank you very, very much and um, look forward to the questions later. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you also for also so much for bringing also some of the your perspective in terms of the, not term, terminology but also the importance of research and the overlooked areas of research and how we can we can connect. Thank you so much. So I think we are ready to move to the next speaker, and the, our next speaker is uh, Apollonia Rodrigues, and she's going to talk about Alkiva Dark Sky Reserve, the first starlight reserve. Apollonia, feel free to share your screen and unmute yourself. We can see your slides, but we cannot see you or. Yes. And uh, okay. It's Perfect. Now? Yes. Yes. I started the, the share the, the screen without putting me, myself and the sound and uh, it disappeared. So um, I'm talking here. Uh, let me first say that I am from the field of managing and, and in tourism and planning. So I'm not from the side of astrophysics or uh, astronomy. So I started this uh, dark sky in Portugal as a destination for astrotourism for our purpose, not uh, as uh, because I wish it to, to observe and so on. So it's the different kind of uh, perspective and approach. To, to give you an idea, this is what we have now in terms of the territory. It's the dark sky Alkeva, the first one that started in 2007. Uh, we grew up, we grew uh, since we started with six municipalities. Now we have 10 and the part of Spain. Um, with, the, uh, with our work uh, and the, the knowledge of uh, our achievements, uh, two other regions in Portugal asked us to, uh, to be involved in this network of dark sky. And uh, we have now dark sky de Xisto, it is in the center of Portugal with uh, 4,000 square kilometers. And we have another one in the north of Portugal, so having a network uh, with the interior of Portugal, inland area, inland area in Portugal. So we have another one, it's uh, around a, a natural park, the, the only regional natural park we have in Portugal, and uh, it's around 1,600 1, kilometers square kilometers. So, this is uh, what we have now in Portugal, three areas under our concept that we will explain a little bit. And uh, all are certified. The first one in, in, to be certified and the first in the world uh, as Starlight Tourism Destination was Alkeva, as I said, in 2007. And, and nowadays it represents 40% of Portugal working under this um, brand and dark sky concept. So as I said, it is a territory based uh, in, in the concept and the mission. Dark Scale Kiva was the first one to born in 2007. So it, we passed all the, the, the growing of the market since 2007. And what we develop, we developed our destination under a, a model that I started to work in 1998 with another project, the European Network of Village Tourism. And uh, what we do is a model of sustainable uh, development in our de uh, sustainable development in our uh, destinations is an integrated model. So all the elements are part of our uh, sustainable development model. And 
in this case, in, in the dark sky, we use the, the, the resort sky, night sky, as uh, our unifying and differentiator element, element. And then we join all the natural heritage and cultural resources, community, and the tourists as a part, integrating part, uh, integrated part of our um, dark sky uh, process or, or destination development model. We, what we have is a concept in the brand, dark sky. Uh, we have other brands uh, working with uh, under our the same uh, organization. The Dark Sky Cave is also a separate brand. Uh, the Dark Sky Patrol is a, a, a patrol of uh, guardians that we are developing uh, to create more empathy uh, in, in the light pollution um, battle. That is a terrible battle to, to fight. Uh, it's supposed to be easy uh, to make people aware of how transversal and important could be uh, fighting this uh, type of pollution but in matter of fact it's not so easy for many situ situations many uh, especially social situation and we have also our concept of astro tourism uh, that is uh, where we consider the atmosphere above us and the sky above us part and integral integ integral part of our destination so we developed a special concept. Our dark sky uh, is a brand, it's our brand, our registered brand, but we uh, have a certification that is what we differ from other type of destinations. We could have two, three or more certifications and uh, our name is one, the certification that we have above us are different. So we decided to follow the Starlight Tourism Destination certification because not only uh, guarantee three a technical criteria plus the availability of the resource. So we have clear skies, more than 50% of our uh, nights are uh, clear skies. In our case, in Alkeva, not in the other two, but in Alkeva, we have 286 nights, uh, medium uh, nights, clear nights per year. So it's a very uh, interesting uh, way because it means that we can offer during all, all year round our product. And of course, we have a huge commitment with the protection of the night sky and um, a touristic offer, uh, high quality, uh, based uh, in, in these uh, principles of sustainable development, plus the fighting the light pollution means protecting the night sky. Um, as I said, always certifications qualify the destination, but is the brand that confers reputation and recognition at in national, international level. In terms of our dark sky concept, uh, we have a huge commitment within territorial identity and sensorial tourism because for us it is an experience. It is something that you have to bring to your, you will bring to your life, to your self inner being. So it means that is an experience, something that you could uh, added value to your uh, person as a person. Um, but uh, all our destinations. Uh, are based in in the, in the territorial identity that you find. So what you find in Alkev is different than what you find in Aldejo Xisto, Val do Tua, or another territory that we will uh, nationally, I mean in Portugal or outside Portugal, we, we will develop. We support the creation of specific and complementary night activities. And we integrate all these offer in a network of official partners that uh, pass for a, a process of training, auditing and support. And we also have a code of ethics, uh, not only for the public partners, but also for our official network of partners. Our mission, because we are a nonprofit organization uh, that started with all this process, uh, we always try to, find, to, to show people that Dark Sky and our concept and brand Dark Sky can be uh, perfect or can be perfect compatible with uh, development. So we don't want to, to get back to the, when there was no artificial light, but uh, we say that if we do in the right way, we can have uh, astrotourism, our dark sky, Alkeva, Valdutu, and Aldeias do Xisto, and also um, guarantee that these regions continue to develop. All can be done with an equilibrium. And uh, for us, the night sky is the world mankind uh, heritage. So if it is a humankind heritage, all of us should be uh, dark sky or astro tourism or whatever ambassadors. So depending on what you consider as um, um, the name. This is part of our observatory, the official observatory of Dark Sky Alkeva, so where you, we show and have sessions of stargazing. 
this is an old primary school in a, a small village, 60 people uh, living there. So it's a very small village, but uh, uh, that integrated this concept and uh, it's working with the old part, the, 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 the identity, the, the territorial identity with the new part that is uh, astro-tourism in, in this territory. Here it is uh, what you could see above us uh, in our territory, our Milky Way and the ast um, astro uh, photography workshop. So it's a very uh, requested activity in our territory. Here it is archaeoastronomy because we also developed this th thematic in the north of Portugal, especially in the north of Portugal. This is a group uh, of astrotourism uh, workshop. This is what you can capture uh, as a deep sky objects from our observatory. I just give you here one idea. This is another part of territory with water and uh, the, the Milky Way. So you can know what we have. Another object of uh, deep sky means that the sky should be good to, to to allow these uh, captures. This is uh, the type of landscape we have here in Alentejo. So you can, it's open, few people, uh, few light pollution. So it's why we could have started immediately with a high quality of sky. Uh, and we are close to a, a, a international airport, uh, close to all the facilities you can, can find. So you have accommodation, restaurants of all type, five stars, uh, motels, uh, whatever you can find in terms of accommodation and all uh, tourism activities and uh, all other attractions plus the dark sky on it. And uh, the, if, for example, this is an event of Perseidus that you can do here, uh, bird watching at night. Uh, we have also developed this type of activities. The, the wine, of course, we are a wine region, so we do blind wine tasting, so at night. Uh, we work also, uh, I'm not from the, I, I mean, I didn't develop my part of uh, as, as an um, expert in, I prefer the practical point of view, but also develop some research. So we are part of the working group, uh, WNWTO, uh, Scientific Tourism and Astro Tourism. So to develop more this uh, thinking about what we could do and how sustainable development based in astro tourism can be good for this type of regions, rural regions, and also other organizations. Uh, we have also partnerships with other uh, international organizations and for this, in this case with the Embassy of United States in Portugal. So they bring us to, to this territory, some uh, um, astronauts or uh, experts, scientific experts from NASA, for example. And uh, since 2013, we were awarded for many in many organizations uh, by for our work as a learning um, activity experience as a tourist destination or uh, sustainable our work in sustainability. Uh, so uh, 2020, it was very good. We were in sustainability, green destinations uh, and other uh, awards for the work we are doing, not only in astro tourism, but also um, mixing, uh, or, or using the resource uh, and, and night sky in implementing an integrated model that could bring and, and create a, a very good type of uh, tourism that is a high standard tourism, people that stay more longer than the usual uh, type of tourism, two, three, four nights. And they prefer to be in, a, in the regions that they are still uh, more uh, close, what, what you expect from a community. So it's not uh, tourism that is already prepared just for tourists. It's tourism that also can be consumed by the residents. So these people like or this type of tourists that we are attracting now, they um, protect, they, they feel very interested to be in, in a protected area, not only for the night sky, but also in a, in a more wider uh, way. This is other, uh, fortune, some other um, awards. And in 2021, we are still getting some different awards. Just to finalize, I want to show you some more pictures that you could take in our region and to see how the beautiful is our Milky Way around all the our area, 7,000 square kilometers. I also wanted to say that uh, um, we have, uh, um, an astro tourism uh, conference 
it passed so quickly that uh, you couldn't have time to see it. But let's see, show here. Uh, the International Astrotourism Conference by Starlight, it will be in between 8 and 11 of September. And we also uh, organized or, or uh, created uh, some years ago the Astrotourism Society. So it's uh, dedicated to think of, over the astrotourism process and how you can develop this using uh, the dark, under the concept of dark sky brand or other uh, concepts or other brands. But uh, uh, we started this uh, with the thinking that we have to manage the practical point of view with the research, but uh, thinking in our destinations, thinking how we can bring added value for these regions, uh, thinking not only in the earth, but also joining the sky as part of this uh, concept and the dynamic complex that is a destination. So thank you. I had a few times, so I have to be quick, <laughs> Pedro. Thank you, Apolonia. No worries. I appreciate And also congratulations also on the amazing awards that you have been receiving over the last years. I think it's also recognized a bit of the work and somehow pioneering work that you have been doing in connecting hot tourism in a, in a very broad way with, with astronomy and the, and the dark skies. So I think we let's move to our next speaker. That is Ben Colley uh, from the South Africa's uh, Association of Field Guides, and it's going to talk, uh, tell us more about the advanced astronomy qualification and the program that they've been putting together. Uh, ben, thank you so much for joining us today, and I can already see part of your presentation, and I think you should be able to share, uh, to unmute yourself and turn on your camera, and I think we'll be able to see you. Okay, great. Um, hopefully you guys can see the screen and both hear and Perfect. see me. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm uh, very honored to have been asked to to, to present here. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, that's quite a tough act to follow uh, from the previous presentation. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction uh, into uh, myself and what I do and what we are trying to promote within the guiding industry in South Africa. So uh, I have a, a small, it is just myself at the moment, independent company, uh, Celestial Events, uh, which is sort of where all of this began. So in terms of my history, I'm actually a well, from England originally, and I moved to South Africa about 15 years ago because of my love of wildlife and uh, tourism. Um, and was fortunate enough to work within the guiding industry uh, in, in and around the areas uh, close to Kruger National Park, but I've also spent time in East Africa and other provinces within the country here. Um, and yeah, so uh, I always found that guests were, were particularly interested in uh, learning more about the night sky as part of the sort of more traditional safari experience, uh, just because of what it can offer. I'll go into a bit more detail as to why I feel that's such a good <clears throat> opportunity to grow the industry in a moment. But uh, just very quickly, so uh, Celestial Events was formed uh, a couple of years ago, um, and we specialize in doing uh, what I call our night sky safaris. So traveling to destinations, be it to guests uh, internationally or locally, um, and delivering uh, hopefully educational and entertaining evenings under the skies here. Um, obviously, the big part of what we're going to go on to discuss is the, the Fugaza astronomy training, which I'll come to in the next slide or two. Uh, we also do some photographic tuition, astro and long exposure uh, photography tuition. Uh, we also have a, a virtual stargazing branch uh, and I do presentations. And there are other things in the pipeline as well. Um, so a lot of this is going to be quite relevant to what Sonala was saying about nature tourism and particularly, uh, particularly from Hannah there and um, with regard to the guiding industry. So in terms of uh, why I think uh, game reserves, particularly in South Africa, are, are such a, a perfect um, springboard to, to launch something like this is, well, a, as we've already discussed, South Africa has, is a bit of a hub for astronomical research, thanks to the Karoo and the southwest of the country, perfect weather conditions, water one skies, um, and obviously the, the, the large telescope and research set up there at the moment, such as the, the SALT South African Large Telescope and the Meerkat, uh, and the SKA and so on and so forth. Uh, but in terms of how it really helps the game reserves, because we are situated, or the majority of game reserves are situated in and around the area close to the Kruger National Park, which is in the sort of northeast of the country. Um, that is where the majority of international tourists do come uh, on their trips uh, for safaris and so on and so forth. Uh, to give you an example, Kruger National Park alone, uh, this is obviously pre-COVID and uh, the, the effect that that's had on tourism, uh, would welcome well over a million visitors each year. And that's just into the national parks. That's not including the, the private reserves that border that land. Um, 
we've got incredibly good dark skies. Uh, the majority of skies in and around the Kruger National Park area are uh, sort of Bortle 2 to Bortle 3 skies. So we have a wonderful opportunity to, to view fantastic southern skies from here. Um, and the whole idea of stargazing uh, is so synonymous with the safari experience just because of the ambiance around it. Um, a lot of these international tourists are coming from uh, large population centers uh, in Europe and in America and other countries. And they just haven't seen uh, dark skies like uh, we can offer and so how some of these other initiatives are, are also uh, utilizing as well. Uh, so it creates a remarkable ambiance, especially with the, the animals as well. There's something very special. There's the connection between all of us and, uh, and nature, I feel. And when you can look up and learn about the stars and sort of immerse yourself in nature while surrounded by wildlife and, and hearing the wildlife around you, especially at nighttime, is a, is a pretty unique perspective. And it is something that um, leaves people with tremendous memories, uh, I believe, more so than just seeing a lion, for example, but hearing a lion roaring whilst discussing the stars in the background is, a, is something that uh, it's priceless in terms of an experience. Uh, the other thing, of course, in South Africa is we have a very rich cultural heritage. Uh, Hannah touched on that uh, for us in, in Namibia as well. Um, and so we have lots of nice sort of cultural and tribal stories that, that can be shared. So certainly when we do our evenings, we focus very much on the cultural side of it. I should go on to say that I'm not a trained astrophysicist. I don't have a degree in it. I'm a, I'm a keen amateur that wants to, to make a difference and, and to educate. Um, and then finally, that sort of holistic experience, the, the whole idea of the reconnection of nature. When people come on safari, it's generally to spend more time amongst the animals uh, and find themselves to get away from the rat race. And there's no better way to do that than by staring up at uh, beautiful, clear skies and uh, imagining what other possibilities are out there. So let me get to the crux of this before I run out of time. Um, so I'm here to represent FAGASA, the Field Guide Association of South Africa. Um, and they are the governing body of our industry, we have been operating since the 1990s, um, and, or 1990, I should say. Uh, and their main crux of, uh, of what they do is to regulate the safari industry and ensure that a, a high level of knowledge uh, is um, uh, passed on to all of the guests uh, from the guides. As a guide, we are a sort of a translator of nature. You have to be a good communicator. Um, and what Fogaza has done is come in and tried to set a standard uh, that is across the board to ensure that all tourists are, uh, get the same experience. So uh, as myself as being a member of Fogaza for many years, what I discovered whilst doing a lot of safaris out here is that there's a bit of a lack of knowledge um, in astronomy in general and stargazing and navigating the night sky. It is part of the, the syllabus, but it is just one of many modules that, that have to be covered in order to get uh, the qualifications. Uh, so I approached Fagaza a few years ago and suggested that uh, we could do a specialist astronomy uh, uh, syllabus as a, and a manual and a qualification to try and encourage the, the growth of uh, guides' abilities to, to translate the night sky for guests with a particular emphasis on the environmental uh, and the cultural aspects. Um, and so that is what happened. And uh, so we produced uh, this. It took quite a long time to put together because I was sort of doing full time work as well. But very proud of what, uh, what it is there. It's the, uh, the Astronomy for Gaza Learner Manual, the Advanced Astronomy. Here it is in, in person. Um, it's obviously quite a, going to be a bit too much to go through exactly what is in there. But in terms of what's covered, what I particularly wanted to do was try and have a, what I would consider a one stop shop. Uh, as a guide, we get asked an awful lot of questions. Uh, whilst we're out there, people are, are very inquisitive these days. So I wanted to put a little bit of everything in there. Uh, as I said, it's not too technical in terms of the science uh, because it's more important to be able to pass on that sort of basic um, knowledge uh, to people and let them go on and explore the discipline more for themselves. So just very, very quickly, some of the chapters that are covered, a lot of it in terms of planning. So when the best time to do these uh, evenings are in terms of moon phases and celestial events, how to use a telescope, how to use binoculars, uh, a lot of uh, a bit of well, a little bit of the history of it all, then a section on the astronomy in South Africa in terms of what's happening down in the crew and other research. Um, obviously then galaxies, quite in detail about star formation, because when you're going on to discuss deep sky objects such as star clusters and nebulae, you need to have a little bit of background knowledge. Uh, what I called celestial nomads, which are things like asteroids, uh, meteorites, uh, comets, and so on and so forth. Sun, the moon, and the planets, uh, with particular emphasis on how uh, 
uh, they mirror the earth or not so in terms of say the, the atmospherics and the weather conditions and the geology found uh, on those uh, other worlds. And then obviously the crux of it really is the, the constellations um, and with particular emphasis on the mythology and deep sky objects which are visible to either the naked eye or binoculars. Uh, some telescopic offered, uh, objects have been covered, but not many lodges have access to telescopes at the moment. So it was more important to be able to do sort of naked eye and binocular observations. So in terms of the process of, of how it works, um, what we offer is the, is a on-site theoretical and practical training, normally conducted over four or five days with uh, lectures and practical sessions each day and, and each night. Uh, lectures obviously focus very much on the book, again, with that emphasis on the communication and the understanding of concepts rather than specifics. Um, and the ability to, to translate and to communicate to the guests. And then the practical training we break down into various different sections, such as non-zodiacal constellations. So the zodiacal constellations will do one evening of telescopic viewing, um, and then a chance for, <coughs> excuse me, a chance for a recap. And then most importantly for the guides to, to practice presenting that material to each other. So uh, there is also a workbook which has to be completed uh, based upon the manual. That's uh, out of about, said, about a thousand marks or so in total. So those chapters on uh, referring to each chapter in the manual. And then the, a theory exam that needs to be written. It's a two and a half hour exam, again, based uh, upon the book. And uh, Fugaza has a pass mark of 75% for all of their exams uh, because, well, we, we don't want to be average. We want to be better. Uh, than average so we have quite a quite a high pass mark which we, we expect people to get to um, and then because the practical application of this is so important uh, we do a practical assessment process where by their assess of specific outcomes that need to be tested in terms of the ability to uh, identify what is visible at that time of the of the year or that time of the, the night depending on when it's being done um, and assuming one passes or a guide passes all of that, they will be awarded with a, the Fugaza Certificate of Advanced Astronomy. Um, we also recommend refresher training every three months because when guides are showing guests the, the night sky, it does tend to change quite a lot uh, depending on what time of year it is because you're operating quite a specific time on a, on a night drive or just after dinner. So in order to account for the changing skies, uh, that's, that was quite important to do. So in terms of how industry reach and how well it's been received, uh, bearing in mind it's, it's very embryonic at the moment um, and the, the recent events over the last year and a half or so have uh, made things rather tricky, certainly. Uh, but to date, we've conducted events and training in over five different provinces within South Africa uh, and some of the reserves that some of you may have heard of, the Sabi Sands, Timbabati, Kasiri, Nambiti, Thornybush, Balkofunden, Manileti, those are across various different provinces. It's a list of some of the, uh, the main lodges that we've done training at, some of which we've been to multiple times because they've really embraced what they feel that it, the, uh, the guides are getting from the, um, from the experience. We're also working with some of the Fugaza training providers. Um, so guides uh, in the making are also now being um, given the opportunity to learn more about astronomy as part of their courses. Uh, we've got a couple of projects on the go. I'm actually in the next few days going up to one of the areas close to Kruger to do a presentation for some of the community guides. So guides who are not members of Fugaza itself, but are still uh, qualified guides that want to learn more about um, uh, the night sky and uh, the cultural stories behind it. And we've even had inquiries from other Southern African countries uh, and East African countries. Uh, as well as operating our own uh, independent training courses for guides who maybe are not currently based in a lodge, there have been a lot of retrenchments recently, uh, so they can still have an opportunity to come and, and learn the syllabus and learn more about it. Uh, in terms of the photos here, this is the team from Londolozi Game Reserve on their airstrip um, doing a quick evening. Uh, this was a local event down here. Is the guides from um, a lodge called Makanyi. Uh, Simbambili in the Sabi Sands and another local event just for a, a couple that we also do. So it's been very well received thus far. And in terms of, of the reception, as I said, I, I can't, oops, sorry, I went too far. I can't give you too much in terms of numbers at the moment, but um, when we, the training that we have done has been very well received. Uh, you can see there's some testimonials I've had from um, some very influential people in the industry. I've just highlighted areas which I think were quite important. Things like, um, obviously, uh, John Dixon, who's a very well-known 40 years of experience of a uh, safari guide there, recommending future safari guides also involve the training. Another thing, just sort of words I like to pick out there, enhanced our guests' experience 
Um, the guys at McCanny have even purchased their own telescope now on the back of the training. Uh, totally unique experience and more than educational. Achieve our ultimate goal of a holistic, holistic safari experience, faster and easier to capture audience and clients' attention. And particularly this last one, more confident about my knowledge base. <clears throat> What we found is a lot of guides are interested in it, but it's quite a scary topic. Uh, and you just, uh, the guides just need a little bit of guidance to have the confidence to present to, uh, to tourists. Uh, that's very important in terms of communication skills, the way in which it's being done. So other projects that we have sort of on the horizon or the way that um, hopefully the qualification will grow in time is actually registering the course directly with CASITA, which is the Culture, Art, Tourism, Hospitality and Sports Sector Education Training Authority. So it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but they are the governing body of the, the tourism and hospitality industry and uh, sort of working with them slowly to be able to uh, have the course as a standalone qualification so that anybody can theoretically um, have a recognized qualification within the discipline. Um, there's a big push towards astrophotography courses at the moment, particularly again with the international tourism coming here for the safari industry. We have a lot of access to people um, who've got very nice camera equipment and are always looking to try their hand at a new skill. Uh, we were discussing uh, starting some school groups, but obviously, again, with the, the COVID situation, unfortunately, that's all somewhat rather on hold at the moment. Um, some astronomy tours so to visit areas like the Karoo um, and the, the research which is being conducted down there. And the community upliftment, as I said, we in the next few days, we're going to go and uh, do some more of that locally. And obviously we have plans to do more of that in the future as things grow. And then finally, just some of the problems that uh, I think we as an industry and in, in the, the, the Field Guide Association has is uh, general awareness of, of getting the information out there to people that it's something to do and how well it is received by guests. That's the whole crux of where it came from is that they just felt that um, guides didn't have a sufficient knowledge of it. It wasn't something they were too aware of and this now will hopefully give them the ability to do so. Uh, Hannah touched on it as well, the ability to find these cultural stories, much of the African cultural stories is oral tradition, um, and they're becoming more and more difficult to find, and that's why it's very important, I think, for the guiding industry to be involved, because they work so closely with the local communities, with the local trackers and staff members and the local villages. Uh, we have a great opportunity to, to rekindle some of those stories and keep them alive. Um, the summer weather in South Africa is a problem in the Kruger area, it's more tropical climate here, so we do have quite a few thunderstorms and rain, so to look at options like virtual stargazing um, and virtual reality technology, potentially something along the lines of a planetarium in this area to make uh, use of all the tourism that will, will hopefully return soon. And then the last one to mention is the sort of the safety and accessibility. Uh, obviously, you can't just go anywhere uh, out here and set up at the side of the road. You have to be in a relatively secure area, so somewhere that is preferably fenced. And if you are obviously going to be working with animals from a guiding perspective you need to be very careful that other animals don't come and join you on the evening uh, i've had over the last couple of years lions elephant rhino leopard all join on um, evenings so safety is very much paramount um so i think i'm running over time so that's a very very quick oversight uh, but the the crux is that it's been very well received so far it's definitely growing um, and i hope to see uh, even more growth within the industry and more interest over the coming years Thank you so much, Ben. And, and indeed, we are running a bit late, but uh, Sorry. I guess we also know where it's, no, it's also not your fault. I've been keeping, uh, keeping leaving everyone to speak a bit more because we have so much, so much content and interesting stories to share. So I really appreciate that you're that you doing that. And thank you so much for the very comprehensive overview that you provide about the trainings and how do you do it and how complete they are. I think it was really, really, really inspiring also for others. So our next speaker is Pablo Alvarez. Uh, and he's going to talk about the national strategy to astrotourism in Chile. Thank you, Pablo, for joining us. Please feel free okay. to share your screen and uh, turn on your camera. Okay, here I am. Yes. Uh, thanks very much, Pedro, for this invitation. I will go straight to the point uh, because of time. Well, as you may know, uh, Chile is a very small country. We have 17.5 million people that we, we count for a very tiny portion of world's population. However, good news are that we have a national strategy for astrotourism. 
So, and it it sounds like a little bit like a, a joke, but uh, because being a small country, and and, we, and as far as we know, we are the only country that has this a national strategy for astrotourism. So that is what I will talk a little bit about now. It, this was developed in from 2014 to 2016. It, it was it it, it was developed by I, I lead a small consultancy firm that has been working with government with public funding for this purpose. And Corfo is the name of the main agency in our country that gives money for this kind of projects. And and this process involved. A, a, all the main stakeholders that public and private and related to science and also obviously related to tourism. It, we had to develop, when we started doing this, we didn't have like, there wasn't any kind of international society for astrotourism as the very good idea that I heard Steve Fouquet at the beginning of this talks he proposed. So we had to develop our own definition of astrotourism. And we, we adopted a very broad view of this. So we decided that we were going to put inside our strategy all kinds of recreational or touristical activities, even those that involved a lot of educational uh, dimension. But we were not going to study those activities that were just educational because they, they, they were like fit in another box. And, and we were dealing with uh, things that related to cosmos, celestial phenomena, and human efforts to study and understand what's going on in the sky. So that, that put inside our field of study all what ancient uh, relationships with the sky, but also what astronomers are doing today, and that can be quite amazing, especially in a, in, when they are in the, in the frontier of science as we see in Chile a lot. We started this, this process with three big surveys, one on supply. We visited every single place in the whole Chilean territory that they provided a astrotourist, astrotourism experience. We made another, another study on demand, and we were getting figures about public audiences, spendings, etc. And we also made a, a wonderful survey about the global state of the art. We visited places in Canary Island, Catalonia, France, UK, Arizona, California, Hawaii. I'm really sad we didn't have Apolonia Rodriguez Alqueva Reserve in, in our scope because I would have loved to visit that place also. It really liked, I really liked it. Uh, after that, we did this diagnosis. We identified main gaps and challenges, and obviously, what followed this was to put this roadmap for ten years. And five years have passed since then. It, just, a, a, I will just give you a, a quick glance of some issues that came from the surveys to give you an idea. What is astrotourism in Chile? We identified one hundred and twenty-nine providers of eight different types, private firms related with tourism, public observatories that they, 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 they belong mainly, mainly to a city authorities or municipalities, international scientific observatories, obviously, planetariums and museums, etc. We also identified, and I think that it was, this was also a, there was other person that mentioned this in a past talk, nine different type of products, night observations with telescopes, naked, naked eye night observations, visit to scientific observatories, etc. And we counted for 2,000, a 262,000 astro tourists a year. And that, that is a, <laughs> it's funny because it, it, that is like a one quarter of what Griffith Observatory in California receives, but, but just that single location in, in the US. But that is what you will, you will receive in the whole territory of Chile. And we made, we, we made the, the math and we counted for $5 million a year in tickets. That is rather modest. And especially when he, I think that was Hannah also mentioning a study in Colorado that, that was far beyond this in concerning incomes or revenues generated. It, 
what which were the main gaps and challenges that we identified the the most important one, one was related to a very basic experience design i mean once you are there and you paid your ticket and you go to visit the place what you get from it is quite modest so and they they resembled this 129 they were very very similar one to each other they were too similar one to each other so that means that if you have seen one you don't have too many stimuli to see to visit another one and in general terms they did very low um, use of the natural and cultural environmental resources all this uh, cultural stories even information about its natural surroundings they were not being intensively used in in their experience design and, and another another main gap that we that we identified was concerning guides so that is what what i found that what ben colley was talking to was a very interesting and we have had a lot of that experience during for the past two or three years in chile also and many of the guides they they really would benefit from a some kind of astronomical training and also from a, some of an improving of their english skills or other language skills that are quite poor in chile uh, usually uh, the, 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 the other main gap, it, it's, a, it's a very important one, in my opinion, is that, uh, I, I will show it this way, um, this is the biggest, we can argue about what I mean with that, but I don't have time for that, observatory on Earth. I don't know if you have known it personally or some have been there. This is Alma in the, in the northern part of Chile. This is, and this one is the most powerful optical observatory on Earth nowadays. It will, it will be, it will pass to a second place in a couple of years when another one that is 20 kilometers from this one will come into operations. Well, the thing is that these places are completely unique. So to visit that place is a, is a lifetime experience. And they happen to be both in Chile. However, they only receive visitors one day per week. And if we count the total visitors of all scientific observatories in Chile, that we do have a lot of them, they are visited only by 5% of astrotourists in Chile. So this, this is a severely underused resource that we have in astrotourism in Chile. And it's a big challenge to change this. I can tell you a little more about what is going on in this discussion. What is our vision, the, the one that we developed at the national strategy? And I'm sorry to say for all people that are not Chileans in the audience, but we put as our vision that Chile will be considered the best astrotourism destination. I'm sorry, Portugal, I'm sorry, Namibia, in the world due to the quality, diversity, and sustainability of the experiences it offers to its visitors. This is La Mano del Desierto. It's a, a, an amazing sculpture, a very big one that is in the middle of the desert where people gather there to take photos of the night sky and whatever. It, I will tell you a brief idea about our main goals in this strategy because it gives you some idea about which are the main challenges or gaps. I was talking about quality and I said that Poor experience design means poor quality. So we had some, some, some goals on quality levels. Another one's on guides that for them to be better prepared, better trained. A, to have more diverse a, experience offers for tourists to choose. Considering positioning, we put, uh, put our goal that astrotourism will be one of the five main activities carried out by foreign visitors. That means like, well, wine and skiing are possibly the two, the two better known and, and nature and some nature tourism. Sustainability, that means to, uh, su to succeed in some effective dark skies protection. And there are a lot of things happening. There's a discussion of a new law these days going on here. We, we propose to triple our visits a year and to multiply the 
income for a, at least for four. Okay. I will not get into details. I will just mention you that we developed like 60, we, and they were designed in quite a detailed way, 60 initiatives in seven strategic areas that covered visitors' experience, human resources, infrastructure, equipment, and resources, sustainability, marketing, coordination, and some other high visibility or iconic actions that were a little bit related to marketing. What has happened since uh, 2016, where, when, when we developed this? Uh, the first bit, well, what, how has the roadmap been executed? I must say that in, in concerning like a, a, it's, a, its coordination or whom has taken responsibility of this plan, a main responsibility has been assumed by regional governments. That's like a state government in not, not, not our national government, mostly from Coquimbo where Eva Robin a observatory is being built, La Silla, Tololo, Gemini South, etc., and Antofagasta, where, where there are uh, Paranal, Alma, uh, the extremely large telescope, and so on. And that, and very unfortunately, in my opinion, coordination at the national level has been abandoned. I mean, uh, in, in theory, there is one person in charge of this at a governmental body, but they're really, and they say that they're they're not being followed. So, so this strategy is like regions are taking parts of it, and they're trying to do their best, and so on. Yeah, the main executive, the main initiatives that has been executed or are being executed, are related to experience design and guide training. That's that's good news. This, for instance, is some kind of experience design workshops that we have been conducting. I, I'm speaking, sorry, I'm, my firm has also gotten engaged on this stuff. This is, this is in San Pedro Atacama, but we have done, and that's a four month program uh, for developing experience design in, with, with entrepreneurs, with small firms. We have done uh, some others in the Coquimbo region also. Okay. Uh, main gaps and challenges that we, diagnosed at the beginning of the strategy are still pending, including what I mentioned about visitor programs to international scientific observatories. This, we do not have, as, as the coordination at national level has been abandoned, we do not have actualized figures of visitors at a national level. However, we do have, because we, we, got, we got involved in some regional program, we have some like a kind of uh, a sample of what's going on in one region, and we could assume that happens uh, on, on a national level. Visitors have increased in the past five years. All these numbers are obviously pre-COVID. They have increased in Antofagasta by almost four times, and multiplied by four, all, all, almost. Uh, it even uh, slightly bigger has been the, 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 the number of providers that have appeared. So many small entrepreneurs have appeared. 70% of providers are micro. They're very, very small companies. And they will classify as micro firms in, in our terms here, but that means nine employees or less. But I would say that most of them has like three employees or less. So that means it, an extremely fragile uh, system. And it's very modest. Astrotourism, it, it's, it, there, there is a, like a, a, a contradiction here because it sounds very sexy, very appealing. Everyone loves the idea in Chile, but the reality is that it is performed at a very modest level. That's the reality. And that has, been, and that has meant as a couple of person, uh, people mentioned before me, COVID has been devastating for this. So many of the people that worked in our workshops during the past three years, I think that I, I, I'm not exaggerating if I say that 60% have run out of business. And I mean, have they sold their telescopes and they move into Santiago again. So that, and that has happened to a lot of them. <clears throat> I just want to uh, end my presentation sharing a few a few ideas, uh, not just to talk about planning and strategy. 
a, I will just give you a, a brief idea, but in our experience, having seen what we have seen in Chile and in other countries, what makes a good astrotourism experience? The first thing that I would say is that looking at the sky is not enough. And uh, I'm sorry to say, but it, we have seen many times that it's if that's just the issue, there are a lot of people that will get a little bored after 10 minutes. And when you move your telescope and point to another star, okay, they will go there. But the third time they will start to look around what else, what else are they going to do? And together with that, I will say, even if you have powerful telescopes, yeah, I don't know the experience of each of, 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 of who is hearing this conference, but looking through a telescope can be quite disappointing. You will not see very well. The image will be very faint, very dark. The first time you see at a telescope, you say, are you kidding me? Was this all about? And that is especially true because we face the unfair competition from movies. And we have this in our retina and in our memory. And we do have it. And this is not what we see at a telescope. We have we even we even have this for screen savers, and we do not see it this at the telescope. It what we have seen is that key factors for a good experience, for a, for a good astrotourism experience is experience design is putting together these different issues that like place, resources, um, um, ambientation, food, drinks, seats, uh, something to keep you warm, etc. And the other key issue are guides. If you have a very good experience design and a very good guide, you can have a wonderful astrotourism tourism experience even in a light polluted city. Well, even more in a dark sky place. And in astrotourism experience design, key rules are set by tourism. So I, I, I love this to be happening in at IAU a home a, because in, in this case, key rules are not placed by science. Yeah. And that means that things have to be pleasant and fun. However, for scientists, tourism offers science outreach an unbeatable opportunity. It offers no nothing less than it offers the chance to reach large audiences. This is the explanation that is in front of the Griffith Observatory in, in Los Angeles. It's crowded, it's full of people. It's full of people that go there because the place is beautiful and there are some wonder, wonderful exhibits. And when they, and the night comes, you can see, you can gather some star parties that happens on the terrace. It, well, and I would say that if, I, if the goal of scientists is to provide a meaningful science outreach, giving some joy and fun can't be that bad. Am I right? Well, that's it. I, I hope it didn't go too long, Pedro. Thanks. No, Pablo, it was, uh, was good. It was within the time. And uh, uh, thank you so much for the uh, interesting presentation, also providing some very interesting tips how to design uh, great uh, uh, astrotourism experiences. And also, we are pre publishing today a manual that you wrote a couple of years ago about how to design uh, these astrotourism experiences. And we're going to share the link also with the people that are following us here, because I think it's a great guide to get started in astrotourism. Thank you so much, Pablo. So okay. uh, running a bit late, uh, we're going to go finally uh, to our last speaker, Soichi Banarchi, and she's going to give us an outlook of the Responsible Tourism Initiative. Soichi, I think the you can start sharing your screen. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah, just okay. a moment. Perfect. Can you see it? We can see it, uh, but we can see all the browser. So I think yeah, you have yeah, to no, click on, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 
so thank you so much uh, for inviting me here today and um, i think i used doing an uh, doing an absolutely fabulous job of cross pollinating ideas so congratulations to all of you we can't continue to work in silos and hope to bring any real change and after hearing all of you today i mean i if i if i needed any more convincing i'm absolutely convinced and thank you so much mr alvarez for your uh, wonderful presentation before me because uh, i am a travel journalist and uh, you know i also a responsible tourism consultant i uh, work for an organization called outlook responsible tourism initiative here uh, in india and we are an affiliate member of the un wto we um, support and celebrate tourism that is people friendly and planet friendly uh, across india and south asia and i'm really here to share a few quick thoughts that i had on how i think in the post vaccine world nature communities and the night sky can create many many more livelihoods and how we can sustain those livelihoods by creating a wider audience for it especially in a country like india where uh, astro tourism or dark sky tourism or whatever you want to call it is still at a rather nascent stage although as you have seen already we've started very well thanks to uh, sonal asgotra and her team at global himalayan expedition now uh, the pandemic uh, you know has has uh, dominated our lives it has dominated uh, headlines it has changed the way we perceive risks and uh, you know over the last few years a uh, last year and a half all the trends and patterns that have emerged um, you know just looking at those it's also very clear that it has changed the way we travel one of those many trends that i wanted to quickly pause on because i've pinned my hopes on it is uh, you know is is what i think the kryptonite or the very catalyst for change that many of us in the tourism industry have been waiting for and that is uh, the thirst for nature and thirst for open safe spaces um after being i guess you know cooped up in our houses um practicing social distancing so much that it becomes second nature to us it is even after we are vaccinated uh, it is going to be a bit difficult for us to walk out into a crowded space and not feel a bit uncomfortable so it will take a while for that to change however as we all know there are a lot of people who are itching to travel uh, you and i included um, so you know there are, there are words there are phrases like revenge tourism being bandied about and what that really means is that uh, travelers want to avenge all the holidays that they have not had in the last year and a half they want to make up for lost time by going for more holidays the question is how do we take this latent demand and steer it in the direction of uh, well sustainable responsible regenerative tourism whatever you'd like to call it but the form of tourism which is um, gentler and which is uh, more beneficial to the local communities and to the environment uh, which also of course includes dark sky tourism now uh, there are a couple of other um, you know trends that support this larger trend i just wanted to quickly touch upon them one is the fact that there's been um, a clear upswing in domestic tourism across the world um, people are looking you know people are looking for new experiences in their own backyard they're exploring their own countries and what that means is not only are they discovering new places for the future tourists to come and discover later uh, but they are also taking some of the pressure off the places that are very very popular so um, ask me i mean in india um, if i had to go back to the taj mahal for the 49th time i don't think i, I think i'd take a minute to think about it i would rather go somewhere which was uh, you know a little bit further off the city limits so that's fantastic i think the other fantastic thing is that um, globally uh, 80% of the tourism industry is made up of smes and of um, you know entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs and that i think is a huge advantage because um, as principles of sustainability get more and more mainstreamed um, i am absolutely sure that uh, you know these entrepreneurs will seize the opportunity and they'll see the business sense of actually adopting and you know developing astro tourism even in countries like india where it's where you know it, it hasn't really been explored too much as yet but who is the traveler that we are trying to attract i mean who is this traveler that we are trying to steer towards astro tourism steer towards regenerative tourism 
uh, do we even know whether this person uh, you know would like to see the night skies do we even know that uh, you know th they will make that connection with forest bathing i think hannah was mentioning about the health benefits will they make the connection between sustainability and uh, you know personal well-being and uh, personal health and hygiene especially at a time like this well uh, we don't know um, we don't know what will happen immediately after the pandemic because the human mind is a you know it's a difficult thing to predict but we asked a few people here in india uh, in may 2021 and uh, you know this is what they had to say we we reached out to about 1542 respondents across 50 cities in india um, and uh, you know it was deeply reassuring to see some of the findings that uh, you know that the data points suggested one of that uh, of course was the fact that many many people said 88% um, to be exact said that they were more aware of sustainability now than they were 10 years ago which is a huge win for us because you know um, it's it's really nascent uh, even sustainability is only just uh, hitting its stride in india so i think it It's fantastic that you know that that the travelers are uh, that the travelers claim that they are much more aware. Uh, it was also fantastic to see that a staggering 96% said that they prefer to go to a hotel, a homestay, or a BNB or a travel operator that claims to be more responsible towards the environment and towards the locals, and that they were willing to pay a premium for it. so i think we've come a long way and these data points indicate just that they also said that uh, you know when they take holidays they go for a travel experience they they prefer it if they have the opportunity to go for a nature walk as well and uh, when they take their children or their families out uh, for holidays especially at a time like this they are looking to expose them to newer experiences to get closer to nature and to uh, you know and to experience non motorized activities so i mean just give me a moment to pause here because just this slide alone is enough to um, enough to suggest that something like dark sky tourism something that like dark sky tourism where where community uh, communities are leading that leading such initiatives um, can be absolutely fantastic uh, even in a country like india which has not seen very much of this so far but um, you know we are talking about communities a lot i you know others have also spoken before me about indigenous communities but uh, what what do we mean when we say um, you know we'd like to create alternative uh, livelihoods um, you know for these communities we'd like to make them resilient we'd like to ensure that you know they have more opportunities uh, all of this is great but who are these communities do we even know them and uh, you know my uh, my experience in the last few years um, has allowed me to be in touch with over 5000 uh, travel organizations that many of whom work with communities so i can tell you this much that um, in our subcontinent while there's greater uh, expectation on the traveler to go local there's also um, much much more pressure on the communities to offer what they're calling authentic experiences and uh, that's you know that can be sometimes at odds with the community's own expectations the community's own aspirations and hope and their own individual you know their own sense of you know ideas of individual growth and individual freedom um so you know so how do we address that and i think uh, you know they in this day and age when many of them have access to the internet even in rural areas many of them have access to phones the televisions even a motorbike like the kind that you see in this slide right now um how i mean they all want to be at par with their uh, you know with their urban counterparts they want to do exactly what they are doing one they want to be on social media but they want to do it from the comfort of their own home close to their families in the rural setting that they've grown up in and how can we provide it to them i think that's where uh, dark sky tourism especially the ones uh, which are uh, you know which are uh, going to work with communities will come in will step in and especially for women as we know um, at least in our subcontinent stem subjects are not taught to them certainly not at the elementary levels so we want i mean it would be fantastic if we can encourage that um, you know encourage that to happen and give them uh, the possibility of leading better lives in the geographies that they are currently based in of course all of this fits it's all quite in sync with the you know the global road maps that uh, organizations like the world travel and tourism council or the unwto have been drawing up 
and uh, you know i'm not going to pause too much on this but effectively all they're saying is that tourism can pivot more powerfully from the pandemic and create more livelihoods once again if we prioritize the health of the people and health of the natural world and link it all up with sustainability and um, and this again is something that we know very well that tourism has a multiplier effect for local communities so every time that we create one direct job in the tourism sector whether it's through astro tourism or, or anything else we are creating three jobs in all and that's really vital both in terms of uh, arresting migration from uh, rural you know communities to mega you know uh, from uh, rural geographies to mega cities and in terms of arresting um, cultural erosion which again many of you have touched upon that's something that is um, that that until recently nobody would talk about and it's only now that we are reaching out to the elders in the community we are you know talking about um, talking about oral histories and documenting that and that would be fantastic if we can do that as well in the context of astronomy i mean sonal just talked about uh, um the himalayas i mean the silk route passed through that area there is so much uh, you know that we can learn from them so many stories that are waiting to be told and i think there is a captive audience for it um all of us are travelers i mean for a moment if you just forget that i am a journalist you're an astronomer all of us are travelers at the heart of it right so um think about it we are we are uh, based out of urban areas and uh, we love to travel but um you know in when we are in our own homes when we are in urban settings we usually have some form of entertainment that we rely on right with a walk to the pub a quick dinner at a restaurant or you know watching netflix in the time of the pandemic um really i mean whatever we do uh, we have some form of entertainment so many of us not everybody but many of the people who are only beginning to discover let's say something like astro tourism will want something to do and uh, you know over the years we've been trying to dissuade them from sitting around bonfires because in many places like ladakh for instance uh, wood is scarce and you know we we rather we rather that they opted for other opportunities like walking safaris at night the kind that ben spoke of um, you know or owl night jar moth walks which are guided or in india very often if you are lucky you get invited right to weddings and uh, of course there are festivals and local fairs through the year uh, but even as i say that i i have to you know i have to maybe tweak it a little bit to say that they are sporadic i mean there are festivals and fairs at different points in the year but the night sky is there through the year and i think that is a fantastic opportunity there are many many places in the subcontinent for instance which are uh, which have low humidity places like the thar desert uh, the you know the, the, the ladakh which is a cold desert then we have the rain shadow areas in spiti and so on there are many many such places where uh, astro tourism can be developed and where we can work with local communities to ensure that we create ecosystems like the ones the dhe has created that are auto mated now finally i just wanted to quickly draw a few parallel connections with bird watching and uh, be because i think that uh, there are many commonalities bird watching uh, you know uh, both in terms of the profile of the bird watcher and in terms of the trajectory that the bird watching tourism industry has taken over the last couple of decades it would be interesting to see how astro tourism can perhaps take a few you know take, take a few pages out of their book really uh, because think about it who are the you know who are the, i mean bird watching is one of the I, i think many of you probably know this already so i am you know stating the obvious but bird watching is one of the fastest growing um, you know sub segments of nature based tourism uh, it's grown by 300% in some markets and in the us alone it's valued at about 40 billion a year uh, but it's not about volumes it's about the kind of uh, traveler that the bird watching industry attracts so you know if you just think about it there are i think about four kinds of travelers that they attract one is the casual traveler um, which also includes people who are doing it for the very first time including children who are fantastic even for astro tourism uh, then there are of course the amateur bird watchers and the uh, you know hobbyists then there are bird uh, photographers who want that fantastic shot which is no different from astro photographers right um, and finally there are the hardcore bird watchers or like your hardcore astronomers who are there for astral events and really all they want is um, you know fantastic dark skies and a safe uh, comfortable bed to uh, you know turn into when the night is over and the sun rises but um, really i mean i think um, 
even in terms of bird watching, there are a few other very important points, but I'm just going to talk about the fact that uh, bird watching seasons don't necessarily coincide with tourism seasons. They um, sometimes in some geographies, they you can watch birds all through the year. And in fact, that's that's true for most geographies. So I think that could be true for astrotourism as well. And if we can spread out, uh, you know, travelers through the year, I think it will take a huge amount of pressure of really, really fragile um, ecosystems where astrotourism can be practiced to begin with, right? You can't go to a place where, um, you know, th these are all places that, that are already quite fragile. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's all that I really wanted to say. I think um, we need uh, all, all of you to help us out um, to marry the best that we have in community-based tourism with what we know about uh, astronomy and ensure that uh, we can, you know, we can, we can deliver a certain quality of experience to the traveler because like I said, the first three travelers, whether it's the casual bird watcher or the casual astronomer, the uh, hobbyist or the uh, you know astrophotographer these people may be easier to please in some cases if you if you figure out the logistics but how do you please the please please the astronomers who are there for really serious reasons so we have to be able to please all of them and and i think that's where the future lies so i'm really hoping all of us all of you can help us and, and uh, thank you so much for listening thank you so, thank you so much for your presentation, also for bringing it together in a, with a different perspective and, a, and also an interesting perspective from other fields. So, of course, as you all know, we are running a bit late. There was a lot of interesting discussion happening on YouTube, a lot of interesting feedback. At the time, we had more than 200 people following us, which is really interesting. So, what we're going to do, we're going to send an email to everyone that registered at this event. We're going to try to share as many presentations as possible, uh, depending on how the, the, the speakers will be available or not to share the presentations. We also, we're also going to collect a, a bunch of links that we have so everyone can actually be informed and involved with the future activities. As you know, astrotourism, and especially astrotourism for social economical development of local communities is one of the flagship projects of the IAU, Office of Astronomy for Development. And uh, we're going to also ask you to then register on a mailing list so you can be more informed about the ongoing activities. So I think I'm going to then go directly to the closing words and closing remarks. I'm going to ask uh, Professor Ivina van der Souk, the IAU International Astronomical uh, Union President, to say a few words for closing this workshop. Ivina, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Can, you can you? Yes. You, can you see me? That's... We cannot. Uh, let me see. Now I think we'll be able to see you because I just want to put on the spotlight. Okay. Ah, there you are. There we go. go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Good. I thought I put a beautiful uh, night sky behind me. So thank you so much, uh, Pedro. Thank you so much, Erod, uh, Ram, for, for organizing this, this uh, meeting. It has been a fascinating uh, two hours, uh, beautiful presentations. Um, normally, this time of year, I'm actually camping in the Western US and uh, seeing these beautiful skies above me. So when several of you started your talks with your own experiences that certainly resonated with me as well, both in Colorado and California, but also in Chile. I mean, uh, the beautiful skies in Chile, uh, just uh, the VLT site, it's one of the most beautiful um, places uh, to, see the, uh, to see, the southern, uh, see the southern sky. So um, we've heard uh, a number of great talks and thank you all for participating uh, in that. Um, clearly so much is happening already in astrotourism and I, I knew some of it was happening but not actually uh, the extent of it, um, especially in some countries. Um, we've heard about Japan, uh, the Sora uh, uh, experience uh, from uh, organization from Akata-san. The game reserves, um, beautiful combination, nature, the, the big animals with the big sky. Uh, Portugal, um, I really want to go there now, <laughs> now that I've seen the, the pictures. Uh, India, the Himalaya expedition is, uh, is one of the, the highlights uh, of the OAD um, uh, platforms that we've had. And of course, Chile has so much potential. Um, and I, I think there's a really, really a potential to grow there very significantly. 
Um, so to come back to Steve Pompea's first uh, initial talk, because that was a great talk and I, I can recommend everybody, I think now that we've heard sort of the full scope to go back to that talk. Uh, because he mentioned, as he mentioned, so much is happening already. And, and where do we fit in as, as astronomers uh, and also as the IAU? Um, where is our niche? Um, so I think several of you confirmed that sort of the dark sky tourism, so not necessarily everything of say space tourism, but the dark sky tourism is really the niche for us to, to be in. Um, the ecotourism, uh, reconnecting with nature was mentioned uh, several times. Um, also then the cultural, the educational aspects uh, that are there. It's great to see already several handbooks. I was impressed by the South African uh, training that is there and even the exam that they have to do very good because indeed high quality guides is, is going to be uh, key here. Um, but also in mental well-being that was mentioned. Uh, so many people you know, need this recharging. I need it myself and the recharging just in nature. Um, from our busy uh, from our busy lives, and it's good to see that there are surveys that there's research being done into this. So, so there's a lot of material already. Um, but um, I think what uh, uh, Steve also mentioned was uh, it needs to be principled ecotourism, total quality management. I think are the words that he used. Uh, the obligations to local people, uh, as Sonal said, you cannot just simply parachute in. Um, you need to basically do this holistic development with the communities uh, in order to make it work and to make it work in a sustainable way. And I think that is a, a very important point to keep in mind in everything that we're doing. And I'm glad to see that the tourist industry is, is thinking along the same lines uh, now. So where do we go from here? Do we, do we go really to a society for a new society for astrotourism? Um, you know, the, the, the case seems easy to make with the examples we had today, um, but we have to keep sort of the SWOT analysis uh, in mind, uh, both the, 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 the advantages that we already have, the opportunities, um, but also the potential pitfalls and the, and the threats. And also, where does the IEU fit in? Um, the IEU actually has as part of its mission, the protection of the dark and quiet skies. Um, we have just done that through conferences, through a big book uh, that also has a, a chapter on dark sky oasis. So we are very much aware of the uh, importance uh, that all of you are doing in protecting uh, the dark skies uh, through these dark sky oasis. We've also have a, a branch in the, the OAD um, in terms of our flagship, the social economic development, uh, the Himalaya, again, as one of our pilot uh, projects. Um, so that's another angle. And then there's the angle of the education. Um, we can certainly help, uh, you can certainly help with uh, writing these handbooks and, and keeping the education part uh, up to speed. So, um, this is sort of, I think, where we need to go from here. I think this has been a fantastic workshop to, to get sort of a lot of things on the table. And now we need to, to think how we go from here. We need to think big. I, I agree with uh, um, Steve in that respect. Um, but some of the experiences can also be rather simple. You know, maybe we don't need a whole experience as the uh, Lode part that was uh, plant in um, New, New Mexico. Maybe just a simple minimal telescope, um, question is how minimal, is already enough. Um, maybe you just need well-trained people, which storytelling is very important, um, and having an experience surrounding it. So, so this is something to, to, to further discuss and, and to go from there. And also then, if we go out for money, um, how do we, you know, what do we really what is our, our, our vision of, of what we want to um, get in the end? The, the experience of partnering with other um, uh, industries like the Birdwatch experience is, is a very interesting one, um, given some of the similarities, the day with them versus the night. So I, I think I want to end here by again, uh, congratulating um, uh, everybody and thanking them for their uh, contributions. I think we've learned a lot today and I look forward to taking it uh, from here and see 
how we can go either to a society or something else uh, in the in the next uh, um, in the next uh, months. I, I mean, I hope we don't wait much <laughs> sort of the next meeting. That I think we need to build on this momentum that we've gathered now and uh, and move try to move forward from here. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Ivina. Thank you for your words. And I guess that's it. Uh, we're going to close the YouTube streaming now. And thank you once again for attending and to all, all our speakers for the fantastic talks. Thank you.